These hearings may take two or three days, but eventually the case will have been presented and the judges decide amongst themselves which one of them will write the lead judgment. At that stage, it's back to gathering up an enormous amount of written material, cases to revise, and new material that's been cited. If Lord Hope is writing the judgment, it also means a long journey. The best way he can approach the task is to go where he can guarantee silence. The problem in London is that because we're busy hearing cases all the time, you don't get time to settle down and really read and think. Whereas here I find it very peaceful. Well, what happens is that I have a case like this, which um, is I'm going to be writing a judgment on later, and uh, I've carried north with me uh, the, the written cases for which I've been able to shrink down to a manageable size, which I can put in my bag. Um, I couldn't possibly carry all the authorities that we, we've cited. Having created the space for quiet concentration, Lord Hope can now approach the judgment. The kind of work we do is very much an intellectual exercise of identifying issues and working them out according to their quality and their weight. And that involves a lot of analysis. You need to express yourself very clearly in writing. You have to have a clear idea of the thread you're following. And you need to be aware of the audience you're addressing. You're writing not so much for yourself as for other people who are going to have to use the judgment. The aim is a balanced and just result. But as it's impossible not to have opinions or feelings, the question of impartiality is a serious one. It's at the heart of the idea of justice. I don't, don't think one ought to be too emotional, frankly. I mean, the, the trouble with emotion is that one tends to take sides based on emotion rather than rational thinking. And that isn't a very sound basis for judgment. Somehow, as a judge, you have to detach yourself from the emotion of the occasion. And you are probably the one person who can do that. You learn to, to become quite detached, actually. I mean, it's, it's long experience in, in court work. In the case Lord Hope is looking at, an individual's risk of bankruptcy hangs in the balance. As it happens, this particular case is right in the, in the field of, um, of emotion in the sense that people's lives are being uh, very much affected and one can feel a genuine feeling of sympathy for the people who are in that position. The system trusts that a judge will know the right place for emotion. Yet Lord Phillips recognizes there is a tension between the decision he may like to reach and the one the law tells him he should reach. You need objectivity. You can't afford to let your own feelings or emotions take charge. Because what you feel, what you might like the answer to be, is not necessarily relevant. This process of weighing up how you think and how you feel means justices may not commit to a decision until surprisingly late on. There are some cases where, until you're writing the judgment, you don't see where it's, it's taking you. It may be driving you in a direction which you really didn't want to go. But this is what the law says. There's no avoiding this particular answer. It's because emotions do have a place in the process that a judge has to be so self-aware. It'd be quite wrong to say that one doesn't feel emotionally. Uh, we have individuals who come into our court to hear how we are going to resolve the cases in which they personally have been involved. And some of these cases are, involve a great deal of emotion. One has enormous sympathy for the individual. You can see how much this case means to them. And sometimes you know that the decision that you are handing down is going to cause them immense distress. Uh, and that is something that you feel yourself. One case where the justices were torn between following the law and following their feelings was a high-profile case that affected millions of people. Bank charges. Millions of bank customers hoping to get a refund on overdraft fees will be disappointed tonight. The Supreme Court has overruled previous judgments and it means there'll be no major investigation of charges on customers who go into the red without permission. Many customers had felt bank overdraft charges were wrong 
and had expected that the Office of Fair Trading would investigate. But their hopes were dashed by one of the first big judgments of the court. We have held that overdraft charges form part of the price or remuneration for the package of services that the banks provide to their current account customers. This means that the OFT cannot consider whether, in imposing those charges, the banks are giving fair value for money. Campaigners felt extremely let down. What we need is fairness. We haven't got fairness. We've been told it can't be assessed. The banks have got away with pilfering our accounts for years, and I'm afraid the big institutions of the law have just backed up the big institutions of finance. Banking charge is a good example of a case which was potentially very puzzling for the public. The public might well have, have understood that the real issue was whether bank charges were fair or not. Um, but that wasn't what we had to decide. We had to decide whether the OFT themselves could look into that question. And we decided, looking at the statute that set them up, that no, they couldn't. It was off limits for them. Finding the OFT remit was laid out clearly in law. The court had no time to maneuver. They were not able to rule on what they thought the law should be only on what it actually was. I think, personally, uh, I would have been quite in favour of the Office of Fair Trading looking into bank charges. It's a good example of a case where, if I'd had complete freedom to decide whatever I wanted, I might well have said, yes, you go and have a look at them. Uh, but we had to look at the statute, uh, and we decided that, no, uh, it simply wasn't within their terms of reference. It's because the justices are bound by the law that there will be times when even they cannot deliver fairness. You never like reaching a judgment which you think is not fair. Uh, you will, if you possibly can, uh, reach a construction which you think does justice. Um, but occasionally you have to reach a decision which you regret. There are certainly cases like that where you're just unable because of the way the law works, the way of the, you're applying law after all, where the result seems very tough and um, one grieves for the individual who is affected by this, but you're, you're trapped by the way the law works into a situation where you've no alternative but to make that decision. In those cases, is, would you say that justice is being done? Well, that's again a relative term. I mean, I, uh, there are some things that uh, are created by law beyond our control which you may think is not very just. Justice obviously is a very important part of the work that we do. We are here to administer justice, but we are here to administer justice according to law. And there will always be occasions when one feels that the result that one is impelled to is not necessarily the one that one would wish to reach. But even if each judge rules according to the law, justice very often faces another challenge. Once the lead judgment has been written, it is emailed to the other justices on the panel. And at this point, it's quite possible that the others are unable to agree. The best that can be done then is a majority ruling with the dissenters writing their own judgments. But is that satisfactory? Doesn't that mean a different justice on the panel would have meant a different result? Morning. If you sit five out of the 12 justices and you reach the decision 3-2, it's fairly obvious that if you had a different five, you might have reached decision two, three, the other way. Uh, and and um, this is one reason why, uh, when we have a really important case, we sit more than five, seven or even nine, so that we involve a, a larger proportion of the court in reaching the decision. It could still be five, four. You, uh, absolutely, and it quite often happens <laughs> that you sit seven or nine uh, and you break that way because uh, often when you do it, it it's because the, this, the issue involved is particularly difficult or it may be a case where you're considering whether uh, we ought to depart from one of the decisions we've made in the past and, not, uh, and that's the kind of knife edge situation in which opinions can differ. So what does that say about justice? I think it says about justice that, that no judge is omnipotent and infallible. 
Uh, it, it's the art of doing the very best you can to get the right answer. I think that anyone who expresses themselves as absolutely certain without any uh, uh, shadow of doubt uh, is either uh, a genius or a fool. Uh, I, I think that uh, um, one can't be absolutely certain in uh, a significant number of cases that one uh, reaches a view on. Making the best of an uncomfortable situation, the justices point out that there can be a benefit in putting these dissenting views on the record. I think it's more satisfactory if we all form the same view with certainty. But sometimes, when it is difficult, it's not a bad thing to have a majority and a minority uh, view. Uh, one can get things wrong. There have been cases in the past where it's become recognised that it was the minority, maybe even only a single judge, uh, who had seen the case properly and got the right answer. One judge may interpret the law differently because of what they alone bring to the case. It may be their legal or their personal experience. There is quite a lot of room for uh, individual interpretation. From time to time, one's own particular approach to concepts of justice and fairness uh, comes in, as does one's own particular background and experience, which may lead one to look at particular factual situations in a different way.